In today's video, I want to share what I've learned over the past week using a go-to mount. This has been a pretty big change for me coming from a Skyguider Pro. And the Skyguider Pro did a nice job, but the go-to mount takes things to another level, as a lot of you have mentioned in the comments. Not only has this go-to mount changed the way I take my photos, it's also changed the way I process my images, and a lot more. So today we're just going to break down some of the most important things I've learned over the past week. The first thing I learned is that dark frames are much more important now. And let me show you the perfect example. Here we see the Spaghetti Nebula. This was about 13 10 minute long exposures with my ASI 1600 Pro and an H Alpha filter. These little strands weren't even visible when I was taking my photos. It's so dim. I had to do a bunch of levels adjustments here in Photoshop to bring out any kind of detail whatsoever. Now let's compare this to my stack of photos where it was just light frames no dark frames, and that is a massive difference. As you can see, this amp glow, or whatever you want to call it, was really ruining the photo, and there's really nothing I can do to salvage it. You know, I could try using the gradient exterminator or something like that, but it would be much better off just going back and taking my dark frames, and when I include the dark frames in the stack, it completely fixes that problem. In the past, I normally didn't see the point of taking dark frames, because for my particular setup with a Nikon camera, and if I was doing Milky Way photography in particular, as long as you can capture enough light in each exposure, problems like this would just disappear. But now that I'm shooting very dim objects in narrowband, that really complicates the process. Not to mention these were 10 minute long photos, which tends to amplify whatever problems are there on the sensor in this particular scenario. So hopefully this shows you the importance of taking dark frames if you're going to be using a go-to mount and you're going to be doing narrowband imaging and you're gonna be taking 10 plus minute long exposures, it really does save the day. Thankfully, I still don't have to worry about flat or bias frames because if we zoom in here, I mean, it's still kind of grainy because it's such a dim object, but overall, it looks great. There's no noticeable vignette, there's no dust spots, and I'm not noticing any kind of horizontal or vertical banding. And the great thing about dark frames with a dedicated astro camera is you can take them whenever you want, more or less. I could just set up my telescope in my house one night cool the sensor down to minus 20 degrees Celsius, plug in the same settings that I used for all these light frames, and take them. Whereas if you're using a DSLR, that's way more complicated, and the dark frames aren't really as reliable. They're almost a waste of time, like I've said in some of my other videos. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that in this particular scenario now, dark frames are a lifesaver. And if you've been noticing some problems like this and you haven't been taking dark frames, that should solve the problem. Another important tip that I learned is you can quickly find the right ascension and declination coordinates on Google for just about any nebula or galaxy that you want to photograph. And for me, this is one of the fastest ways to do my go-to. For example, with the Spaghetti Nebula, I had no idea how to find it in the go-to because I didn't realize it was called SH2240. That's like the technical name for it. And rather than searching page after page for this exact nebula, I just typed it in on Google and it gave me the exact coordinates for the Spaghetti Nebula. Then I could take a screenshot of that with my phone, go back to the ASAR Pro, and type in those coordinates exactly. And within about 10 seconds, I could be framed up and ready to start shooting. And for me, that was a great way to speed up the go-to feature. Now this won't work as well for every object. If I type in, let's say, the Thor's Helmet Nebula, for whatever reason it won't show you the right ascension declination, I don't know why. But if you go to Wikipedia, you should be able to find it here, hopefully. Yeah, 7 hours, 18 minutes, 30 seconds, and then 13 degrees, 13 minutes, 8 seconds. On the other hand, you can see that it's just called NGC 2359, so you can always type that in as well. But it's nice to know the exact right ascension and declination coordinates. I had tried to use these in the past with my Skyguider Pro, where I'd take a photo, plate solve it, and it would tell me, let's say, 6 hours, 40 minutes, but that didn't really help me out because on the Skyguider Pro, you have to manually move the mount. And you don't really know which way to go. And it was just kind of a losing battle and a waste of time. But with a go-to mount, as long as you know the exact coordinates, you can plug them in and just be done with it. Another problem I faced when I was trying to photograph the Spaghetti Nebula is I wasn't sure what focal length to use or even what filters to use. This is where Astrobin really saved the day. And if you don't already have a free Astrobin account, I'd recommend creating one. 
that would allow you to upload, I think, 10 of your own photos and also see what other people are doing. And that's exactly what I did. I went over on Astrobin, looked up some Spaghetti Nebula photos. I found this great shot here. And then he was nice enough to include everything he used. The Samyang 135 millimeter lens. So now I know I need to be between, let's say, 135 to 200 millimeters, roughly in that range. And my Space Cat's 250, which explains why part of this was getting cropped off. Now that I know that, maybe tonight I can go out with my 70 to 200 millimeter lens and try it again. Once I've got the focal length figured out, I can also pay attention to what filters he used. In this case, an oxygen and a hydrogen alpha filter. Thankfully, I've already got both of those in my filter wheel. Now I know to take, you know, a couple hours of oxygen, a couple hours of H alpha, and then I can create a color image kind of like this. You can even see that he used the ASI 183 camera that has a little bit smaller sensor than my 1600 Pro but they're largely the same thing. And if we continue to scroll down, you'll notice he captured 15 hours of data, which you really need for a dim object like this. And it looks like he was taking 10 minute long photos like me, a gain of 111, and a fair amount of photos for each one. And they even have the right ascension and declination coordinates listed here on Astrobin as well. So if you're completely new to an object and you have no idea where to even start, Astrobin is the perfect place. You got everything you need to know right here, provide you can find a photo where they actually include all this, and then you can go out and capture your own images. The next thing I learned is that I no longer need to worry about that ST4 cable for my guiding. And I wanna thank everybody in the comments who mentioned that on my previous video. I was so used to using my SkyGuider Pro where you needed that ST4 cable that I didn't realize you can just connect the auto guider to the AS Air Pro via USB, and then as long as the AS Air Pro is connected to the mount via USB, you're all set. And in fact, I got much better guiding going down this route than using the ST4 cable. I was actually blown away. For the first time, the declination and right ascension lines were right on the zero, and that was a nice change. While I was using the GoTo mount, I also had the opportunity to try out an electronic focuser. And I was really looking forward to this because I thought it would make the night a lot easier. As you see there, you have an up and a down arrow. You can just press and hold on one of them, take another screenshot, and then see if the focus got better or worse. If you do manage to get the star sharp, you can take note of that number there on the left, 27,351. Then you can write that down in your notes. In this case, 27,350 for no filter. If I had my H alpha filter, then I know it's sharp at about 27,800. And you can quickly plug that number into the ASIR Pro and get right where you need to be. The way you would do that is click the uh, electronic focusing icon up top, and then it will allow you to input the current value right there. So this was kind of cool. The fact that you can just know the exact number after you've written it down and immediately go to that spot on the focus ring. Of course, these values will change with the temperature. For example, 27,350 might be good on a night when it's 30 degrees out, but if it's 80 degrees in the summer, then the focus point might shift a little bit. So these are rough guidelines, but they'll at least get you in the ballpark. Another nice feature of the electronic focuser is that you can actually tell it to autofocus your images after a certain criteria has been met. For example, if you go into the menu, you can tell it to autofocus after every two degrees Celsius of temperature change, which is pretty important. Or if you'd rather do it by the hour, you can say, hey, every two hours, I want you to stop taking photos, refocus, and then begin with the image series again. And if you're using an electronic filter wheel, if it's switching between H-alpha and oxygen or whatever, it will automatically autofocus as well if you have it enabled. So there's a lot of functionality built into the electronic focus here in the ASAR Pro. If we go back to the main preview window here, you can hit that AF button on the left to bring up the full autofocusing menu. And this is kind of cool, because if you just hit play, it's going to take a series of photos where your focusing ring is at different positions, and it will score them and try and find the smallest possible value, or in other words, the sharpest possible stars. Unfortunately, this is a very slow process, and it took about two or three minutes to complete. And the final result was stars that weren't even that sharp, which I thought was kind of odd. So it's nice that they have this function built in, but at the same time, in my experience, which is fairly limited, it didn't even do that good of a job and it wasted a lot of my time. To be completely honest, I would have been better off just manually focusing. I could have been done in 10 to 30 seconds and been ready to move on with my workflow.
The final thing I learned this week is that a go-to mount is much easier to use than I ever would have thought. If I'm being completely honest with you guys, I was very worried about getting a go-to mount because I thought it would take me weeks to get the hang of it. I'd run into all kinds of problems along the way and it would just be very overwhelming. And that's exactly what happened a few years ago when I first tried to learn how to use a go-to mount. Every night we'd take that big mount, roll it out into the backyard, and then try and run through the process. We'd do our polar alignment manually, then we'd attach the hand controller and try and do the two-star alignment. But it seemed like no matter what we did, something would go wrong. We'd spend all night trying to troubleshoot it, and we never even get a single photo from the whole experience. This became so frustrating that I just gave up on go-to mounts and went back to using my SkyGuarder Pro because I could have that thing set up in probably two minutes and be ready to start taking photos. So I said, why am I messing around wasting my whole night with something that doesn't even work when I could be using something much smaller, lighter, and easier and get great photos? And this is why I've been so surprised by how easy the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro is to use when you pair it with the ASIR Pro. Using this workflow, I can be up and running in as little as 10 minutes. That's to do everything from the polar alignment to setting up the guiding, getting my telescope focused, finding the object I want to photograph, and dialing in my camera settings and the auto run. Now that I've cleared this first major hurdle in just one week, I'm really looking forward to seeing what I can capture in 2021. And I want to thank Steve Chestnut and his family again for making all this possible. They're the ones that donated the go-to mount, the Raza telescope, which is going to be my next challenge, along with a whole lot of other astrophotography equipment that I'm looking forward to putting to use. So stay tuned for that. There's going to be a lot more content coming out this year, but that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching.